Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of Rethinking Resources. I'm Steve Shade, and this episode has a sizzling hot title, Heat from Within, a Geothermal Odyssey to the Core. In this episode, we will be discussing the hot topic with an enthusiastic proponent of the technology, Peter Seifert. He is one of the founding members of the Geothermal Society of Austria, the GTO, which promotes all things geothermal, arguing that tapping into shallow, mid-distance, and deep sources is both wise and necessary to fulfill Austria's energy needs amid the transition to renewable energy. Peter Seifert, thank you very much for being with us today on Rethinking Resources. Thank you for inviting me. Let's start by giving you an opportunity to explain geothermal energy in Austria and why your organization sees this as the ticket to the future. Geothermal energy is an alternative form of energy, not used very much up to now. It has huge potential and we as a geothermal society want to promote this issue because we see it as a very important part of the future energy needs without carbon, also without oil and gas. So we see the geologic potential, we see the opportunities and we talk to politicians, to uh, technical people, to uh, geologists, in order to promote the whole issue and get some speed and some support from our side. Great. Okay. Uh, Let's take a step back and go to the source uh, for non-scientists like myself. (laughs) Simply, why is the core of the earth so hot? Okay. Yeah. By the current model, earth was built about 4.5 billion years as a cloud of molecules and after a very short time there was a stratification of heavy elements in the core and lighter elements in the outer part of this magma soup. And by the time of 100 or 200 million years there was a segregation of this material and the heavy material was concentrated in the core and the light material was concentrated in the outer parts. So there was a core and a crust. And because of heat conversion from the center to the outer part, they started a heat flow from the center to the crust where we are based now, where we are sitting now. We use this kind of heat because it's a permanent flow of energy to surface. Permanent flow. So it continues to generate heat and... (laughs) <laughs> perhaps more importantly, will continue to Will generate. continue. How long does the Earth and the system of the solar system might exist? Let's see, about 3 billion years or so. There are different models. So for the very, very far future, there will be heat transported to surface. So we are confident that it will last for a very long time without any kind of reduction or disturbance. Okay, and it's not dangerous if we go poking holes in the surface of the Earth. We're not going to let all the heat out and suddenly no, be on de- a, on definitely a very cold not. Planet. Because heat is giving the way more or less to the space anyway, regardless if we drill holes in it or not. Okay, so let's talk about how we get to the heat. Uh, how do drilling technologies uh, play a role in accessing geothermal reservoirs deep within the Earth? Yeah. Drilling technology was developed first for coal centuries ago, then for oil and gas, let's say about 150 years now, and is really ready to be fit for uh, geothermal energy use. So the technology for oil and gas or for geothermal energy is the same. You drill holes, you put in casing, you put cementation in order to close up layers you don't need. So there's absolutely no principal need for the future. There are small changes which are needed. We can talk about this, but no, none in principle. Okay, so now we know what it is. We know where it is. We know how we're getting to it. Uh, So let's talk about the promise of geothermal technology. The promise is safe, clean, infinitely renewable energy. Um, it sounds all a bit too good to be true. So, <laughs> yeah. so where's the catch? <laughs> yes, where's the catch? The good news is um, it's available 24 hours. It's a continuous flow of heat in the Earth's crust. There's no change uh, day by day, week by week, month by month. So it's 365 days 
the year you have the same amount of heat, no changes. So you can calculate precisely what you're getting. And in different areas of the world, you get a different amount of heat per minute, per hour, per day. Um, what else is the good point? You need very little space. This room, about, let's say, six square meters, is good enough for the place where you put one well to 100 meters. After finishing this well, you don't see anything at surface, but the small installation, like many others, not like, let's say, windmills or whatever. You're not reliable on wind, sunshine, on any kind of other outside influence. It's a clearly independent form of energy. You have it in your garden or you have it at a compound of many buildings. Um, there's no difference in price. We are not interested if Russia or Saudi Arabia is increasing the oil or gas price or if they turn the tap down and don't deliver it. I mean, we have it. Geothermal is a true democratic form of energy. So, so all of the plus points keep stacking up. Um, people are worried about how safe it is. People get nervous when, um, when you start drilling into the, to the earth beneath them. Um, so looking back through a timeline of, uh, of, of mishaps, uh, help us clarify um, what happened in some of these places. Back in 2007 in, in, in Stauffen, Germany, there was an incident uh, in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, St. Gallen in Switzerland, in France, uh, Strasbourg, 2021. So a list of these incidents, what happened there? What, what was going on? Whenever you start a new period of uh, winning a new energy form or using a new energy, then of course you have some kind of learning curve. You start and then you make mistakes and you learn from that. So it's getting better and better, safer and safer. In the case of Staufen, People drilled into a formation, a geologic formation, which contained water. The water went up. The casing was purely cemented. The water went into a sedimentation layer where it turned anhydrite to gypsum. The volume of the sediments increased and the center of Staufen was lifted up by half a meter, which means many cracks in many houses and ruined houses. Basel was another mishap. Um, Engineers drilled into the fault plane of two geological blocks. There's a fault between. They thought they might have increased flow of hot water, the good news. But, of course, there's tectonic stress in the sediments. And they drilled into the fault plane and released the stress, which resulted in an earthquake of 3.6 or so on the Richter scale. The people felt it felt insecure, went to the politicians, and they turned down the projects. This time, nothing, there were not big uh, mistakes uh, made, but the model was not correct. We learned from that, and now people do not drill into fault planes, but keep, let's say, 100 meter distance and so on when they do this. So the mistakes were very helpful to develop a safer procedure for the following projects. And you mentioned uh, three or four. And in the meantime, hundreds have been drilled across Europe. Where nothing happens. So and those are the ones we, we don't hear about. But so, if something dramatic happens, it, it makes the headlines. It was very bad for those people, but it was good for the industry of geothermal energy because we learned and it's safer now. Okay, so there are different categories as well um, of geothermal energy, depending on, on how shallow or how deep the source is. So uh, where do you see the most potential here in Austria? Regarding the depth, we have the very shallow one, let's say two meter deep in your garden, you can win some energy. Temperature is about 12 degrees, 13 degrees. Then you use this uh, heat, having a pipe system, putting it into your house, and then by uh, heat pump, you bring it up to low temperature, uh, heating in your rooms, let's say 23, 25 degrees. The so-called shallow geothermal area, we count down to, uh, let's say, 300 meters. This is used for compounds of a bigger size. And the deep one, we count down, I would say uh, 3,000, 4,000 meters we call uh, deep geothermal. 
which was proven in Austria, especially in the east part of Austria and in upper Austria. Um, the data are there. These have been former oil and gas wells. I mean, those wells which tried to find oil and gas and just found hot water. At that time, 50 years ago, not of interest to society and to companies. But now we can use this data in order to focus on specific uh, geologic formations which have enough conductivity and permeability to produce hot water, use it to generate heat, and re-inject again. So hot saline waters are not put into creeks or into the country's surface. They are re-injected again without touching our drinking water systems at the surface. In terms of abundance and, and, and the right depth to get to, to, to the, the best geothermal energy at the right price uh, with the right technology, where is it really located in Austria compared to a place like Iceland where it's, it's, it's mostly shallow? Let's say in Upper Austria, we have several good examples of geothermal heat units at the range of 2,000, 2,800 meters. And there are some of these projects well developed and proven. In the Vienna Basin, there's really high potential, starting from uh, 2,000 meters down to 5,000 meters, if you want. But not any project is realized now. There are very good plans. And in the Styrian Basin, there are a few projects which are already up and running, which have really good potential. Yes, in the high mountains, Hohe Tauern or the Alpine region, there are some good areas, but there are no customers. So if you have potential, it doesn't mean you can sell heat if nobody is living there. Heiligenblut, for example, or Badgerstein, this is, this is not good enough. So geologic potential is one. Economic potential is something else. Um, how about Austria's neighbors? Uh, according to data in Europe, Italy uh, is leading the way. Yeah, Italy, um, as we know, have some uh, geologic zones with volcanoes. Of course, there's higher heat flow around them, but of course, higher risk, especially Naples and, uh, <laughs> and the surrounding area. They are well developed. Um, they use it. This is something we don't have in Austria, this kind of geologic setup. We use the so-called regular or normal heat flow of uh, three degrees per hundred meters. That's what we have in geologic terms in most areas in the east and in the north of Austria. Similar uh, location is uh, southern Germany. We can compare them. They are a little bit ahead of us, especially the town of Munich. They started about um, nearly 20 years ago with one project called Riem. This is the exhibition area and have a strategy that in about 2040, they want to provide geothermal energy to cover 100% of the common district heating system. Vienna has a similar strategy, a little bit far, and will start this project in about one and a half years, one year, one and a half years. In the east part of Vienna, we will do something similar. Although in the east part of Vienna, the geologic formations are deeper and probably might generate more heat than Munich. But they are more or less um, a very good role model for us. Other cities in Germany will follow, but they are far behind. Let's see Berlin and so on. They have plans, but nothing realized yet. Okay, so it sounds like Central Europe, this part of, of, of Europe is, is hot and getting hotter with uh, geothermal technology. But um, let's, let's cast our glance further along the world map. Um, there are many, many countries where there is zero geothermal energy being produced. Um, I'm talking about countries ranging from um, Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. So are these situations where it, it, it is geologically and ecologically attractive in terms of reaching climate goals, but sadly just not economically feasible? Afghanistan wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I mean they have an, they would have enough heat. In our field of energy supply, number one is education. You need a group of people who are educated enough to understand the concept, the geologic concept, and the engineering concept, and then of course make an economic case. I would say education is the first. Number two is the legal framework. 
um, you need a precise legal framework to attract private investors and also, let's say, uh, municipalities, uh, cities to invest. They need a safe regulation. And therefore, in those countries, they don't have this now. Therefore, it's not developed. But in theory, geologically, those countries easily could adapt similar measures. But these two issues are the main problem. Okay. But I think it's just important to make the clear point that the technology does work anywhere. It's just a matter of, of drilling down far enough, um, finding the right places, having the education, the technology, and the financing to do it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And let me ask, why are you so convinced by geothermal energy? It seems like the, the general market has already decided in favor of, of renewables like wind, solar, and hydroelectric as the really big sources of renewable energy. So why are you so convinced by geothermal? There are several reasons. One reason is emotional. This is a little bit funny. You can't see it. You can see solar panels, everybody's happy, says, ah, the sun is coming, and then we generate electricity and heat. You can see in windmills, everybody can imagine, we have uh, thousands of years windmills. This time we produce electric energy. Second, uh, because we see the geologic potential, we have enough data to prove where and when uh, this energy is available. And... Um, we know that it's uh, a permanent flow of energy without any changes or reductions or um, like wind and solar. They are not stable supply and geoenergy, of course, because of continuous heat flow, is coming every day, every night with the same amount of heat from the mantle up through the crust to the Earth's surface. So... It's a continuous flow. Therefore, we like this very much. It's a stable supply. Solar and wind got some support by government, some special funds by some legal framework that the government said, we want to support this. Everybody who is putting solar panels on his roof will get some kind of financial support. Not huge amount, but it's good enough that the people start immediately say, oh, okay, I get financial support, I do it. It's to their benefit, of course, and it works well. There's a huge increase. Geothermal, we are not there yet. We as an association, we talk to government uh, representatives, explain this to them, and it's not only the money, there are some, some other legal issues, but it would help definitely to get started. In the opinion of the people, as far as we know, we put the point forward that it's clean and safe. And I think... People understand it. But when were you convinced? I'm definitely convinced because uh, by education, a geologist, <laughs> that's where I started. I can see the potential in the subsurface and I can see that we are able to manage to get the heat out. And there are mainly benefits and um, not so many risks which we can handle. It is part of a future alternative energy supply. We cannot su supply the full energy we need. Um, if we work uh, about 25, 30 years on this uh, subject, we could cover half of the heat need of Austria, but not more. So definitely, we would need, in addition, other forms of alternative energy. That's clear. But we can replace part of the current used oil and gas, definitely. So let's talk about the, the positive impact and the contribution to, to, to meeting climate goals. Um, what is the role of geothermal energy playing in the context of, of deep decarbonization and transitioning to a low-carbon future? We can use uh, geothermal mainly for heating purpose and, re and replace oil and gas heating systems. We can use uh, geothermal if we go very deep and get out, let's say, water with 125 degrees and so for generating electricity. Part of the energy we use now for generating electricity, we could uh, replace uh, with geothermal energy about, would say, 20% of the electricity we currently use. But of course, we have to drill deep, let's say 3,000 meters and more. Then we get out 110, 120 degrees plus though this is part of the mosaic 
of the future. Not the whole solution. This is not possible. But it's the same for all the other alternative energy forms, pellets and solar and wind and biogas. So in combination of different alternative energy forms, we could replace uh, oil and gas, which we use now, and get a carbon-free uh, energy supply for municipalities, for private households, for industry, manufacturing, and so on. So is the technology being uh, adopted and adapted uh, fast enough for what you and your organization are expecting? Um, are the technology, the opportunities, all being pursued uh, in line with the hopes, the expectations, the targets of the Geothermal Society of Austria? The technology is there. The progress uh, which we need is, for example, that we create smaller drilling units. Look, if you look at Vienna, just outside here, there are many old buildings built in 1900s. If you want to drill in the yards or in, in the garden areas, you have to get in. And the current drilling units, most of them are too big, go through the hallway, th through the doors and so on. So the development, the current, is to build small drilling units to get into the back of those buildings. Another issue is the legal framework. Of course, if there are some changes, and this is the main target of our uh, association, then investment would be faster and quicker. Okay, because you mentioned that Austria is lagging a little bit behind um, its 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 neighbors, but you think we're getting there. And yeah, um, if we change some of the regulations, and our uh, government is trying to do this, one issue is the concessions we need to produce geothermal, like for oil and gas. So the investor has a safe uh, area where he can work and produce hot water. And another thing is access to data of earlier wells. Another issue is uh, who is owning the water in the subsurface. Of course, the landowner in Austria but our legal system says the landowner is owning the whole soil and the earth and the water and everything down to the core of the earth, which is creating a little bit of trouble if you have a bigger project, which is using water from surrounding acreage. There are discussions then with other landowners, and this could be complicated and uh, take time. And time is something we don't have if you want to achieve our goals for 2030 and 40. Okay, you said something interesting um, a moment ago about the technology um, and how it needs to be adapted to, to get into people's gardens or, or, or where you can actually put the drilling in. And this leads me into a question on, on the technology and, and technological advancements. Um, what breakthroughs uh, do we need, can we expect in the future? We can expect, hopefully, <laughs> change of legal framework, smaller drilling units for areas which complicated access. We need support of municipalities. Let's see, municipality of Vienna, Salzburg, Linz. We need probably a measure to share the risk of bigger projects which are risky at the very beginning. If you drill the first well into a new area, it's costly. After winning data from a first well, then it's less risk. The second and the third well are less risk. So if the government, like in Hungary or Germany, takes some kind of risk for the first well in order to support investors. So we are confident and we see some kind of positive moves in the politics and the legal framework and in the technology, we are, I think, well um, ahead the needs. I think um, we are ready to go. It seems like the, the pieces of the puzzle are falling into place. Geothermal is not brand new. We've known about it for, for, for literally thousands of years. Um, yeah, exactly. And uh, cost, legal framework, technology have been factors that, that have held it back, but it seems like all the puzzle pieces are falling into place now. Do you see this? Definitely, yes. Um, sometimes you need uh, something which happens uh, from outside. We are well prepared, but of course the upfront costs for geothermal projects are higher than compared to other 
kind of alternative energies. But since this unfortunate war, Russia, Ukraine, the gas and the electricity prices went up. And suddenly, this was the push why everybody is now speeding up the government, the legal people, the municipalities, the investors, not only geophysicists and geologists, they know what to do anyway. <laughs> so as we wrap up our discussion, um, let's ask you to look into your crystal ball and uh, take us 10, 20, 30 years into the future. How much of Austria's energy needs will be covered by geothermal? Um, how much of Europe's needs? About, let's say, 50% of the need and the use of heat could be covered by geothermal in a few decades, probably 30 years or so, 35. Um, probably 10, 20% of the electricity we need could be covered by geothermal. Regarding transportation, this will change definitely anyway. This is not the business of geothermal. Geothermal can provide also cooling systems, of course, and could provide storage of energy in the subsurface. Times when we produce energy and we don't need it could be stored in some form in the subsurface and then taken out again if we need it. So we are very optimistic that this part of the overall energy need could be covered by geothermal. It's not the only truth. It is a very important part of the mosaic we need for supply a better and safer future. So a super exciting space, and it's great to meet somebody who's, who's playing such an active role in it. Peter Seifert, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us, your ideas, your inspiration, and uh, of course, your great insights with us here on Rethinking Resources. To everybody listening to the episode or watching on OMV's YouTube channel, um, if you have feedback, questions, please send a message to podcast at omv.com. We would love to hear from you as always. For more background information on the topics we discussed in this episode and our guests, check out our show notes where you will find links to lots of valuable information. Thank you again to everybody for sharing your time with us, and we hope you will join us again for the next episode of Rethinking Resources.